Mm. Okay, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. This is the day that you have made, and truly we rejoice and we are glad in it. We invite you intentionally, dear Holy Spirit, to uh, teach us in today's Bible study. We ask that you guide us into the experience of the truth. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that we see what you are showing us, we experience what we are taking us to in scriptures in the name of Jesus Christ. And dear Father, I pray for utterance to speak your word. I ask that you grant me utterance to speak your word with boldness, uh, with simplicity, in clearness, and uh, in, in the flow of your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. That the impact of this teaching tonight would continue to linger in our hearts till Jesus come. That even when other people listen to this message um, at a later time, that their hearts will be furnished by grace and light and understanding will come to them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. And welcome to Bible study today. And happy new month, uh, by the way. If this is your first time, say, listening to us on YouTube or wherever you, you find this video, I want to welcome you to Borderless Christian Community. We are a community of people who love God and who want to grow in our knowledge and experience of God. And here at Borderless Christian Community, we, are, um, we emphasize discipleship where people are, are nurtured into the image of Christ. Okay. And we have been looking at a series called uh, What Pleases God. And the aim of this series was to explore the things that actually please God, all right? And because God is a spirit. And then what, like, like I typically say, if I come to your house and you offer me, uh, let's say, jollof rice with grilled turkey and very soft plantain, you will please me. I will be excited and happy for, happy with you. But you, how about God? What, what, what can you do to please God? What can you do to get God excited? So that's what we dedicated this series to exploring. And it's been an insightful journey. Uh, we started this last month, the month of May. Um, and we're wrapping up, we're wrapping this up, maybe either in today's teaching or, or uh, by the next one, we'll wrap this up. So uh, I said all of this, say, get the teachings. It's on our YouTube, just search for Borderless Christian Community. And you find it there just in case you're not watching this on YouTube. But if you're on YouTube, then you can look at the other videos there. All right, so let's jump right into today's teaching. Um, we we said three main things, just by way of recap, three main things that please God. Number one is our um, our our obedience. Yes, that's number one. Number two is our sacrifices, and under sacrifices, we looked at three sacrifices that we every believer must offer to God: the sacrifice of praise the sacrifice of our possession and the sacrifice of our bodies, all right? So that's under, under um, sacrifice. So what please God, number one, our obedience, number two, our sacrifice. And number three, which we're looking at today is the state of our hearts, all right? The state of our hearts. And this, I believe, is one of the most important messages anybody who has just given their life to Christ must hear, because in the way we build, right, you know, you know, Apostle Paul calls himself you know, a, a master builder, all right? Um, he says uh, that the every work, the work of every man will be tested, right? And he says how you build will be tested, essentially. And so Paul likens ministry work to building. And what, one thing we definitely know in building is the fact that we are building a house, for instance, you don't build it haphazardly. There is a process to it. There is a system to it. And no matter how elegant your roof is, your roof is not the first thing you put. No matter how beautiful your paint is, no matter the color of it, no matter the texture, it doesn't matter if your, your, your paint is photochromic. It changes in, according to the light of the day. It doesn't matter how, how wonderful and amazing the paint is. You don't put your paint right after you lay your foundation. So there's a system to it. And same thing too, as we build people in their, in their Christian work or in their Christian journey, and as, as we build people to grow in God, we need to build diligently because when we when someone gives their life to Christ, they, they found, the foundation of their faith has to be solid before we begin to layer certain things on, on it. And again, this is one of the mistakes, I believe, of or one of the excesses 
of the um, you know prosperity gospel where we bring people to Christ and the first thing they are hearing is that God wants to bless them, God wants to increase them financially, God wants to multiply them. And while, while that is not a lie, you are preaching such a message to a heart that is not circumcised. And so the heart that is not yet circumcised is interpreting that message in the light of his old nature, which is still, uh, as it were, very much alive, all right? Still uh, that old nature of greed, the old nature of covetousness is still very much alive. I beg your pardon, the old nature hasn't been dealt with, all right? And so we are, we are preaching such a message to a heart that is not yet circumcised. And so the, the danger in that, like I said earlier, is that that heart that has not yet been circumcised to God is interpreting that message in light of its old nature. So when he says, oh, um, the Lord wants to bless you and prosper you, the person is thinking, okay, if I pay my tithe 10%, God will give me 100%. So in his mind, it's a, it's a transaction. So if person is paying his tithe, and even when you say give and shall be given to you, he's not giving because he actually loves. He's giving because it shall be given to me. So he's giving because it's a transaction to him. It's like an investment. I put in a $1,000. Uh, after one year, I get $5,000. That's good. Uh, so that's like five, 500%. Then it makes sense. A good business deal. And so that's why when we, when we bring people into Christ, when we have the opportunity to disciple people, we start from the foundation, all right? We establish the basics because every other, every other teaching, every other experience is built on the foundation of that faith. And one of the foundational things that I believe every believer must be grounded in is what we want to talk about today, the state of your heart, that there is nothing more important to God in your life than your heart. All right. And that's why Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That's what we're speaking about. That is, you gain everything in the world. You are a, in fact, you rule over the entire world as a president. There's nothing you desire in this world, in this world that they don't, nobody gives to you. All right. That doesn't come to you. Yet you lose your soul, meaning your heart is corrupted. See, Jesus said that it is worse it's a terrible state for you to be in if your heart is not circumcised, if your heart is corrupted, and yet you have everything in the world. So I want to establish some things again. And, you know, just like Peter said, he says, I'm writing to you again to remind you. So this message would always should always be preached, should always be um, um, should always serve as a reminder in our hearts, okay, uh, about what is really important before the sight of God. Because I assure you, as you begin to journey through life and you go through several experiences, it's easy for you to forget or undermine the importance of the state of your heart because you are aiming for a promotion, you are aiming for a, a, a your master's, maybe to further your education, you are aiming to, you know, get married, to raise your children, to start a business, and all of these things can become so, um, can make you so busy that the attention you need to pay to the state of your heart, you're not paying it. And you see, the heart is a very slippery entity. It can easily slip out of your grasp, out of your grasp, rather. It can easily slip out of the path that it should be on. on. You know, I was speaking with a, a senior friend, uh, this was earlier this week, and we we're just talking about the same heart matter. And she called me and you were just talking about things, different things going on in life. And she said, ah, that sometimes, man, she just looks, the way she described it, she just looks left. And before she knows it, her, her heart has already gone somewhere. And she has to pull the heart back, um, pull the heart back into to God, you know. So it's the same thing that we, we see. Your heart can be very slippery. And if you get so busy without the, without creating time to evaluate your state of being, then you can, your heart can be 10 kilometers away from the path God desires it to be. And you might not even know, you might think all is well. You know, uh, a, a good example of what I just spoke about is the man Samson. That Samson did not know when his heart was being, you know, um, derailed by Delilah. And if his heart had gone so much that a time came where it wasn't just his heart that had gone, it was his strength that also left him. And that his strength was represented by the locks of his hair. And so one after the locks were cut, Delilah woke him up and said, oh, the Philistines are against you. And he stood up to shake himself as at, as at other times, only that this time around, his strength was gone and he did not even know. And there are times where the, the strength of our lives 
we are it's seeping away from us, but we do not know it. We are not conscious to uh, pause and really investigate our hearts. So this might be quite a solemn conversation, and that is fine if I say praise the Lord and your heart, your mouth is too heavy to say hallelujah. I would understand, but I want you to really do a heart inspection after this or during this the course of this teaching. Um, because like I said, nothing else matters to God more than your heart, all right? So we're going to look at this. Okay, so to begin with, I want us to look at a couple things about the heart. Um, and I think we'll just start off on this note. We'll look at several things about the heart of um about the heart and how God relates and deals with us, okay? And we we'll trust that God will grant us uh insight and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start from a from a from a very important um text in First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. All right. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and verse 7. I will do my best to paste these, uh, paste the scriptures in the chat. Um, but just in case I'm not able to, please turn your Bibles there so that we can follow together. All right. So I said first Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. Backstory is this: um, the the king Saul had been, you know, had had been anointed king and he had been ruling for a while, but then he began to mess up. And in fact, the story of Saul in itself is a is a classic example of how the heart can begin to deviate, and what starts as a little uh, temptation can become a stronghold, can become a pattern, can become a way of living until the person's heart is completely hardened. You know, so if you and just speaking about Saul before we continue, uh, if you read where when when um um Samuel anointed Saul, you know the Bible says that God gave Saul a new heart, so God changed the heart of Saul. But you see, Saul began to deviate and deviate and deviate up to up, up to the point where his heart was now hardened so much against God that even when he found out that he had rebelled against God, he was more concerned about his um, his reputation in the sight of people than about making a re um, amendment and repenting and amending his relationship with God. All right. And that's where his heart eventually, you know, got to, and it got so hard and so stiff that he was completely out of the will of God. You never see anything. You never see the, like God had to bypass him to do what he was doing in the, in the, in the land of Israel, even though he was the king. And again, just to say that people may start off on a good note, May start off on a on a on a very um, well intended um, cause, but if their hearts go unchecked, they can end up somewhere really dark. But anyway, so after all of that had happened to Saul, um, God told uh, Prophet Samuel to go and anoint a new king. Now, God did not tell Samuel the name of this king. God did not announce the name. All, all God did was to tell uh, Prophet Samuel the household he should go to. And, and God said to Samuel, go to the house of Jesse. Um, you're, you're going to anoint a king there. So Samuel did not know which of the sons of Jesse he was going to anoint. All right. So look at verse 6, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. It says, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab. Eliab was the first son and said, so Samuel looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And I'm sure Samuel must have looked at Eli Eliab's you know, physique might have looked might have looked at his biceps, his build. You know, maybe Elab was a guy that went to the gym religiously morning and evening. Again, Elab was in the military, as the story informs us. You know, and so he might have looked at this, all of this, and even the prophet was about to make a mistake and said, uh, and said, "This guy, man, you you are you are you are everything. You are spec. You are spec for the throne. You know." But look at what God responded in verse 7, and this way we draw several learnings from, okay? But the Lord said to Samuel, verse 7, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. And by the way, by the way, let me just interject here. We've used this scripture to teach on relationship, actually, and it's a very good one um, to teach people how to... Uh, I know my wife and I were hosting, a, we're, we're leading a group last year, um, um, on, you know, singles and this something we taught them. But anyways, let's continue. He says, 
do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, but because I have refused him. So it's possible, listen, it's possible for God to refuse something that looks so good. And you can, this is true for so many things, not just in relationship, like I mentioned, or even in selecting a king, but even a job, for instance, the job can look so good. I mean, the pay looks great. The, the company is a big company. They are not, they don't think they'll go bankrupt anytime soon or anything like that. Um, the role is a fantastic role. It looks like a promotion for you and everything checks out. Yet the Lord say, says, I have refused it. It's possible for you, God, to for this to also to happen in the case of a city. Maybe God has asked you to relocate to a different country, and you're trying to figure out what city in that country you want to you want to move to. And then you look at all the top cities, and God God rejects it, rejects them. So the fact that something looks good doesn't mean it is good. That's what I'm trying to say here. And in this case, God refused Eliab. And why? Look at uh, verse seven continuation. He says. For the Lord does not see as man sees. So there is a huge difference in how God sees, you know, versus how uh, man sees, or there is a huge difference. All right, just a moment. I need to, um, I hope that's, yeah. All right, there's a huge difference between how God sees and man, how man sees. M God said, says man looks at the outward appearance. He says, God doesn't see, um, the Lord doesn't see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. And you agree with me that what God looks at is what is what is important, right? Yes or yes? That if God is focusing on something, it is because it is important. That means every other thing, no matter how glamorous it is, no matter how appealing or appetizing or well-cultured or well-nurtured it is, is not important or as important as what God looks at. So the Bible says that there is a difference between God and man. And one of the many differences is that the way man sees is different from the way God sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. Man looks at what they can see, what they can feel, what they can touch, what they can experience by their physical senses, okay? Um, that, that's the way man looks. But God doesn't look at that. God looks beyond it. God looks to the heart. And this is one of the very scary things about God. Personally, for me, it's one of the things that makes me fear God. That what I, I may be looking at somebody and I may look at that person and say, Why is person acting like this? Like, and not rate the person. You know how we say it. You know, you look at someone and you don't rate the person. Yet, in the sight of God, this person is of more value than the people you are, you know, admiring, you know, out there. So, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. And this is why this is so important that you may have a good job. You may have a, you know, wonderful house, a wonderful car, whatever it is. But God doesn't look at all of those. God looks at your heart. God looks at your heart. You may even be seeming to help somebody. And I mean, this is also a, a scary thing about God that you may, someone will look at you and you are giving someone you need money. And the person look at, looking at you will say, wow. This brother, this sister, God bless them. Ah, they are so such good people. But God looks beyond all of that and looks at your heart and he condemns what you are giving. It is a scary thing, I assure you, before God. Because you cannot really tell just on the on face value, you can't really tell who is doing right or wrong. And this is true in, in many areas, including for uh, including uh for Christians, okay, that somebody may seem to have everything done right. Yet, God doesn't accept the, the things this person is doing. And the reason is only because of the heart. And this, you check this, that every time God rejected his sacrifice, he did not reject it because of the amount of the sacrifice. He rejected it because of the state of the heart of the person offering the sacrifice. Always, 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 always. A time came where um, um, this was uh, uh, Eli's sons began to burn incense and they were struck dead there because of the state of their hearts, because of the state of their heart. All right. So this is a super, super important topic. And like I said, all through the course of this teaching, just re forget about, I mean, we're not in fiscal space. I would have said, forget about your neighbor, but don't point accusing fingers at anybody in your heart. Point to yourself and really inspect your heart because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at our hearts. 
All right, now we're going to do some things from here, but I want to read another scripture that I, I read today that, um, again, it's, it made me it made me shake, okay? So let's turn our Bibles to, this should be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Notice that it's chapter 16 in both cases, all right? We read 1 Samuel 16, and now we're reading Luke chapter 16, all right? So Luke chapter 16, verse, verse 14 and verse 15, okay? Luke chapter 16, verse 14 and verse 15. Okay, so I'm posting this in, um, in uh, what's it called? In the charts. All right. Luke chapter 15, chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. Okay, so look at what the Bible says. Um, this was Jesus Christ speaking to the Pharisees. Uh, verse 14 says, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money, the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. Okay. Um, so the Pharisees, they loved money and, and what Jesus Christ had just spoken, spoken about was around, about, um, um, you know, you not being able to serve two masters. He says, you cannot serve God and serve mammon. You either hate one or, or love the other. So Jesus Christ had just finished saying this and the Pharisees, because they loved money, they made fun of Jesus. They, they ridiculed him. They made jest of him. But look at Jesus' response in verse 15. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. So the Pharisees had a way of justifying themselves before men. How did they justify themselves before men? They justified themselves before men by what they did. So they carried out actions that made people look at them and say, wow, this this rabbi or this Pharisee is a very holy person. And you know, that's why Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter, chapter, chapter 5, rather, he spoke about praying, about fasting, about giving. And he says, if you are praying, go and lock yourself in your closet. Don't pray on the street where people look at you and say, oh, spirit, Coco, you and hail you. You know, don't give in, in, in public where people will look at you and say, oh, you are a generous sister, you are a generous brother. No. And he says, when you are... Um, and fasting also, don't fast in public. Well, because the Pharisees loved public appeal. They knew how to package themselves so that they'll be justified by men, okay? And Jesus Christ said to them, you, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. So in the midst of all your drama, all your theatrics, God sees beyond these things to your heart. The next sentence is what scares me. He says, for what is highly esteemed among men, is an abomination in the sight of God. So the things that men will look at and they'll applaud you and say, oh, powerful man, oh, great guy. They'll celebrate you. The things that you will do in this day and age that you get a lot of likes on Instagram is probably an abomination in the sight of God. Just think about this. That there are things people applaud that are generally acceptable, but in the sight of God is an abomination, an abomination. You know, have you ever heard, hmm, let's not even go into that. But anyways, have you ever heard people make some statements and you as a believer, you are cringing, all right? Maybe you come across a post and someone says something and you are, you, you are cringing because, you know, this is contrary to the values of God. And you just say, oh, let's even check the comments and see what people are saying. And suddenly you see that everybody is saying, go girl, speak your truth. It's your life. Leave it that way. And you are just amazed and perplexed at how people are applauding what is an abomination before the sight of the Lord. And this is something that, to help you do a reality check. That what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Think about it. And, you know, a good way to do it is, to a good way to start rather is, once you see a lot of people um, applauding or voting in a certain direction or um, approving of a certain thing, that's a lot of people in the world automatically what I do is I put a red flag on that thing first. I, I suspect that thing automatically. Once I just see that so many people in the world are, are you know, going that direction, I put a red flag first. I, I may not condemn it yet, but I flag it for personal inspection because a lot of the things that are acceptable and highly esteemed among men, they're an abomination in the sight of God. I assure you, if you see, if you want to, if you want to really live for God, let me say like Nigerians will say, Omo, you really have to do a lot of filtering because there'll be so many things that people applaud, so many statements 
that have been repeated even by popular people. Unfortunately, sometimes even Christians, but when you inspect them, when you look at them from the lens of God's word, they don't hold any water. So I thought to introduce this scripture to show you how big of a matter this is. Because, you know, Jesus said to them, to say to Pharisees, you are the ones who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. God sees your heart. And what is highly esteemed among men, you know, in the days of Pharisees, they'll see them where, um, there's a word for it, I don't remember now, but, you know, it's it's like a plate a, or a, a an interwoven, you know, batch that is huge, right, that has scriptures written all over it, and they wear it in, the, in their front. And when people look at them, they, they respect this rabbi and say, oh my God, you're a holy man. And anything he says, they hold it with honor because he carries this sanctimonious, high-looking, um, um, high-feeling look, okay? And Jesus was saying to them that all of those things that you put up to get men to honor you is an abomination in the sight of God, an abomination. And this explains, this, this explains to you why when Jesus Christ was born, God did not send the angels to the Pharisees or to the rulers in the synagogues. No, he didn't even send the angel to the king in the palace. No, he sent the angels to the shepherd taking care of their sheep at night. The shepherds that people, you know, looked at, at them and say, oh, these low income earners, all these people that, you know, they are not the high, high and mighty in society. God sent his angels to them. They first got the news that, he, that the savior was born. Because what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Because God looks at the heart, all right? So I, I, I hope this scripture, these two scriptures have sort of put us in, in, the, in the spirit of, of what we're looking at. I want to read out some, make some statements about the hearts, and I will back it up with scriptures, and I, just, I do hope that it blesses you. And it also deepens your understanding on this uh, sensitive matter. So I'm going to make some statements about the heart. Number one is this, and, and even drawing from the scripture we read, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 to 7, that when God looks at a man, the first thing he looks for is the state of the heart, not anything else. So when God looks at a man, the first thing he looks for is the state of the heart. You see, back to our story um, of, Samuel, of Samuel the prophet anointing, uh, looking for the, the next king in Jesse's house. When Eliab came out, he had every feature that could qualify him physically now, that could qualify him to be a king. And by the way, it was similar to the same features that Saul had. That, you know, if you read if you read the account um, from scriptures when Saul was going to be anointed as king, the Bible says that he was tall, he was a shoulder, a, 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 um, or a, a head higher than uh, every other person in his tribe. He was well built. He was, he had a physique. I mean, he was a typical uh, king material. You know how we say it. He was a typical, he fits the description. He fits the profile for a king. But what happened? We all know what happened when, when he was elected or when he was appointed rather to be king. And so there are fiscal things and all those things going on. But when God is looking for a man, God doesn't look for all those things. God looks for looks at the man's heart. And this will shock you, right? Uh, when, you, when we all go to heaven and see things plainly, but you can already understand how God thinks from now on. That God is not looking for, when God is looking for a man, he's not looking for the most skilled man. When God wants to entrust a business to a person, he's not necessarily looking for the person that has the best experience in managing a business. No, because you see with God, God can teach you. You know, um, David says, he, he taught my hand or he teaches my hand how to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my hands. So David did not know that technique. He didn't know how to fight. He didn't know all of those things, but God taught him. And do you think about this shepherd boy who be, eventually became a military giant or giant, right? It's because God taught him. So your lack of skill or presence of skill is not the reason why God selects a man. Um, obviously not even the fiscal outlook, you know, <laughs> let me, it might be humorous, but let me just say this. I've never looked at, looked at a, a guy. Let me use a guy now since I'm a guy, let me put myself, put my gender in these shoes or in the spotlight. Have you ever looked at a guy and you know, you know, you know, if you are by all, by with your heart, truly, you know that of course God makes everyone, you know, beautiful and fearfully and wonderfully made. But if you look at this guy and look at the wife he married. You are wondering, how did this woman accept, agree for this guy? 
Like you're asking how, what happened? Like she, you want to know what did the man say that this woman, as beautiful, as elegant and everything, she agreed for this kind of man. Many times it's not the face, it's not even the physique, it's the heart, it's the heart. And that is what I'm talking about. That the first thing God looks for in a man is the state of his heart, not anything else. Not his experience, not even his anointing. It is the state of his heart. And that's exactly what was demonstrated when Samuel went to anoint a king in Jesse's house. That all the brothers were in military. They had way more experience, but they did not have the heart. The person that had the heart didn't have the military experience, but he had the experience with God in the wilderness. And God used several things to prove his heart, to test his heart, from taking care of sheep. In fact, the willingness to even go outside, you know, outskirts of the city, outskirts of the town to take care of the father's sheep, you know, um, already indicated the state of, the, of, of, the, of David's heart. And David said it somewhere that God took him from taking care of sheep to taking care of his people, Israel, meaning that the same heart David had to take care of sheep in the wilderness or in the outside of the, outside of the city is the same heart God was looking for to take care of his people, Israel. So I'm telling you that what is qualifying you in the sight of God is not your experience, it's not anything fiscal. And in fact, on the flip side, this should be an encouragement to you because you might look around and you say, oh, I don't have all the advantages that these people have. I, I don't have the exposure these people have. I don't have all the experience these people have. I don't have, I don't know how to speak all the, you know, for now, the English, like these people. But God doesn't look at that. He looks at your heart. And if you have the right heart, then you are qualified. Because everything you think you do not have, God can easily give it to you in a day. But the state of the heart yeah, is, is a different matter. That's why God could take, um, um, uh, what's it called now? Joseph from the prison and take him to the position of a prime minister overnight because Joseph's heart had been worked on over years, over the years. So even though Joseph was not an Egyptian, Joseph didn't have any military experience as far as we know, but God could appoint him to a prime minister because the kind of heart God was looking for Joseph possessed it. He had allowed God to work on his heart over the years. So this heart was in the right state for God to use. So I'm telling you that the first thing God looks for is the state of your heart. And this is why we must make it our duty to allow God to amend our heart, to, to weave our heart, to, to tear it in some cases, to stitch it in other cases, to do anything that he needs to do to get our heart in the right um, position. Okay, so let me say that again. When God looks for a man, the first thing he looks for is the state of the man's heart. Oh, I, I, was, I was supposed to give you a, 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 a um, scripture to back that up. Uh, let's quickly read Genesis chapter three, verse chapter four, rather, verse three to five. I'll read this quickly and just highlight something. Genesis chapter four, verse three to five. We already looked at this uh, scripture last week. Was it last week? No, last two weeks, I believe. Um, so I'll just, I wouldn't dwell much on, much on it. Um, in fact, we'll read from verse 3 to verse 7, okay? Oops. From verse 3 to verse 7. So let, let me just drop that here. Okay, from verse 3 to verse 7, Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 7. Look at what the Bible says. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering to offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord verse 4 Abel also brought of the first fruit of his flock um and of their fats and the Lord respected Abel and his offering but he did not respect Cain and his offering and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell so these two people brought and brought their offerings to God. But for Abel, the Bible says God had respect to Abel and to his offering. And I've I said over and over again that God would only regard the sacrifice of the one whose heart is first sacrificed to him. Let me say that again. That God would only regard the sacrifice of the one whose heart is first and foremost sacrificed to God. So God doesn't look at... Um, your, your offering doesn't impress God. Your, your, the size of your tithes doesn't impress God. That you, in fact, gave all your salary doesn't impress God. What first and foremost impresses God is the state of your heart. And we know that the state of Cain's heart was in a 
in a terrible position because we see what Cain did afterward. In fact, God had warned Cain and said, why did your countenance, you know, why are you angry? Why did your countenance fall? And God said to him, if you do well, verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. The door here is the door of the heart. And its desire is for you, but you must, you should rule over it. So the state of the heart is what God looks at first. When God looks at your offering, when God looks at you, when God looks, considers you for a position or a role in his kingdom, what he first and foremost looks at is the state of your heart. Number two statement I want to make, but before I make this statement, I need to make, I need to um, uh, fix something here technically so that my battery doesn't run down. All right, so give me uh, 10 seconds. All right. Uh, I hope. Okay, good. All right. So number two statement I want to make here is this. The posture of your heart can either invite God or shut him out. And what I mean is this, that the posture that your heart sustains can either pull God to you. And you know, there are people you look at and you wonder how, like, why are these things happening to them? Everything just seems to be playing out, you know, in good terms for them. Things just seem to be falling into order, you know, for them. And you look at them and you know that maybe you even pray more than these people or you, you have been a Christian longer than them, but it just seems like things are just happening quick, you know, for them. One of the main reasons is the state of their heart. I mean, there may be other factors, but one crucial and important one is the state of their heart. And the state of your heart can either shut God out of it, out of your life, or invite God into your life. And you see, when God wants to do things, and I'm going to repeat this several times, so please don't get tired of it. When God wants, wants to do things in a man's life or to do things through a man's life, what he looks for is the state of their heart. A person, for instance, who is kind-hearted, it is easy for God to be, let me use the word now, attracted to this person kind of a person. So you look at the person's life and you see that things are just working out for them. But it's because, number one, the state of their heart is a posture of kindness. So God can easily use them to show kindness to other people. And because God is a rewarder, when they show kindness, they have sown seeds for kindness to be shown to them as well. So you look at their lives and you see that people are always doing favors for them. People are always um, blessing them. People are always opening doors for them. It is because their heart has pulled God into, into their lives. Their heart has invited God. There is, there is a strong, you know, for lack of a better word, a gravitational pull that, that exists between the state of their heart and God. And this is what happens. And sometimes it's difficult to explain, but when you observe a person's heart, you can tell why they are where they are today. There are people you look at and God just raises them amongst they are amongst their group of friends or amongst, you know, their community. God just raises them. And you're wondering why, like maybe that let's say two people from the same, the same school, the same, finish the same year, everything looks the same. But how come one person seems to be more elevated than the other? How come one person seems to have made a lot more progress? Among many other things, it could be the state of their hearts. All right. And if you read Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, a popular scripture that we we already know. Uh, but let's take a look at that quickly. Revelation chapter chapter 3 and verse 20. Jesus was speaking here and he said, Behold, um, okay, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And for the record, Jesus was speaking to Christians here. And I, I know we typically use this um, passage of scripture to evangelize and ask people to come to the faith. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in this context, Jesus was speaking particularly to believers. And he was saying that even for believers, he's standing at the door and he's knocking. Meaning there are believers that have shut Jesus out of their lives. 
And one of the ways they have shot Jesus out of their lives is by the posture of their hearts, where people sustain arrogance and rebellion and um, and they keep offense. They are not they are not yielded to the corrections of God. God is shot out of their life. So God wants to come in. God wants to do a work with them. God wants to do a work through them, but they have shut God out of their lives so that such that even though they've been Christians for so many years, you cannot trace the effect of the presence of God in their lives. You know, okay, I can't say this like that, but there are people anyways, you look around and you you know they are, they are I mean, they are Christians quite all right, but when you hang around them, you hear the way they speak, you hear the way they act, you hear the way they respond to people, they respond to even, you know, anger and everything. Ah, you're wondering, and you're saying, ah, well, you just that you cannot say otherwise, but you know that there's something wrong. What happens is that they, they shut God out of their hearts. And let me tell you how you know someone has shut God out of their heart is that they don't even feel any sense of remorse for the very thing that they should not be doing. You know, we can see someone now that on their way from church, <laughs> on their, I'm laughing because I just remember that experience. On their way from church, in traffic, they are calling someone, you big head, you are a fool. Why will you enter my front like that? And you call yourself a human being, God punish you. And they are just came from church. Maybe they even served as ushers where they told people, oh, you're welcome to church. Please, can you sit down here? They're smiling. But just before they got home, they've, they've blown off. You know, I remember one day my wife and I were coming back from church. We stopped over to get food uh, from a, an eatery. And there was a, there was just one, an incident. I mean, it wasn't an accident, but, you know, it was almost going to be an accident. And the people that were at fault, just judging from the way they look and the way they're dressed, that, and considering the time, I, I am... 80% sure they were coming from church. In fact, I am another 50% sure that they've served in a, in a unit, you know, one of those service units that you have to dress up, either ushering or choir or protocol, you know, those kind of units because they looked, they looked uniform. And the way these guys were lashing out on the other person, and mind you, these guys were the ones at fault because we witnessed it. And I was broken, you know, I was really broken because these are believers. These are people that were just really coming from church. And even if we are not coming from church, we are a believer. But you see, they could do that. And in most cases, most times when people, when people do things like that and their hearts don't even prick them, their conscience don't judge them anymore, is because they've shut Jesus out. Jesus is at the door. Jesus at the door knocking and says, please open for me, but they've kept him out. And the way, one of the ways you kick Jesus out is by rebelling, okay, by ignoring his word. I, I, if, the, if our time allows us, we're going to look at that, okay? So um, you, the state of your heart, the posture of your heart can either invite Jesus in or can shut him out, all right? Number three statement I want to make is this. The true weights and size of a man is defined by their hearts. When I mean man here, yeah, I mean man or woman now. So the true weight and size of a person is defined by their heart. You know a large person not by how much fiscal weight they have, not by, the, by what they weigh on the scale, but you know a large person by the state of their heart. You know a small person also by the state of their heart. So there are big sized people that are small on the inside. There are also small sized people that are big on the inside. And in the, in the grand scheme of things, your size and your weight is determined by your heart, not by anything, not by anything. So there are big people living in small bodies, but there are also small and tiny people living in big bodies. And this is a, uh, a classic example rather of these are bullies. Anybody you see that is a bully, anybody, whether you, it's a child or an adult or a grandfather, it doesn't matter the age of that person. As long as the person is a bully, that person is a small person in a big body. I mean, just using school, typical school experience, people, most bullies um, want to use their body, you know, because they are heavier, they are bigger, they are stronger to intimidate others. But that is, that's not just the only case of bullying. You know, when you go into other areas of life, people look for what they, are, what they have more in comparison to others to bully others. So somebody may have a lot more money than another person and then he uses that money to bully. That person is still a small person even though their bank account is fat. So the size of a man, the weight of a man is determined by the state of their hearts. I'm telling you. And that's why you can see a very 
rich man, for instance, but he's so small, so insecure, so um, so so tight-fisted that you, you are wondering how come this guy is rich? Nobody is benefiting from the so-called money he has. Yet you can see another person that has so little, but you cannot count five people and without three of them saying they have benefited from this person's benevolence. All right? And that's why you know that people don't give because they have. They give because they have the heart to give. So it is not the quantity of a person's resources that determines whether a person will give or not. It is the state of the person's heart. All right? So the size of a man is determined by the size of their hearts. Ooh, don't forget this. Size of a man is determined by the size of their heart. Let's read uh, two verses of scripture to, to uh, prove this and support this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 20. Proverbs 21 oops, and verse 20. So you could see big people, but when you come close to them and interact with them, their heart is still small. It's still, it's still you know, tiny. And don't forget the scripture. One of the ways you know somebody with a small heart or with a large heart is the extent to which they can accommodate people. All right. And I'm not just talking about, about, about accommodating people in their physical space alone, but I mean even accommodating people in their lives. And that's why if God has called anybody into, into ministry, or that's in terms of like being a pastor or anything like that, you must have a large heart. You must have a large heart because all manner of people will come to you. God will send all manner of people, the good, the bad, the ugly, the betrayers, the the uh, uh, denials, that's people that will deny you. And God will send different kind of people. Your heart must be large enough to manage all these relationships uh, and still be intact. Proverbs chapter 21. What did I say? Proverbs chapter 21. Um, did I get that right? Verse 2, sorry. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, not verse 20. Proverbs chapter, tw chapter 21, verse 2 says, every, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. So of all things that the Lord can weigh, what the Lord decided to weigh is the heart. So the Bible says that the, part, the way of a man may seem right in his own eyes, right? He says uh, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. So when someone wants to make decisions, it looks correct in his own eyes. But when God looks at it, what he does is that he weighs the heart of a man. So God has a scale, a divine scale, and he puts every man's heart on that scale and he looks at it. Some people weigh one kg, even though on the outside, people are hailing them. People are, you know, they are popular, they have followers, they have all of that. But in God's sight, they just weigh one kg on the, on the weight or on the, on, his, on his scale. But then other people that are anonymous, not many people know them. When God weighs their heart, they are weighing a hundred kg on that scale. Because it is the weight of your heart that determines the weight of your life. The size of a man is determined by the size of his heart. It's not how much money you have or you don't have. It's not how many people know you or don't know you. It is the size of your heart that really determines what you weigh. And if God is going to deal with you, when I mean deal with you is God is going to use you to do things on the earth, right? What he will first do is he will work on your heart. That is, this explains why even though Joseph had the dream right from the age of what? Before, when he was a teenager. He had a dream that one day people would bow to him. He's going to be like a star shining. He, you know, among his family is going to be, you know, number one. Even though he had that vision and God showed it to him right from the days of his teenage ages, yet God had to take him through several dealings that would work on his heart so that the posture of his heart can be altered in such a way that God can eventually entrust the salvation of the entire world at that time into his hands. Just imagine this, that the whole world was, and, and think about this, there was famine in the, in the then world as, as we know from scriptures, and everybody came to buy grain from Egypt. And guess who was in charge of that grain? The man Joseph. So what God was doing was, was preparing Joseph, preparing Joseph to be the one responsible for sustaining the world at that time. But what God did in preparing him and how God prepared him was to work on his heart. Was to work on his heart. Was to work on his heart. It didn't, it didn't necessarily take God because Joseph 
left his father's house as a teenager, as, as when he was 17 years, and eventually became a prime minister when he was 30 years, uh, 30 years of age, okay? So that is a 13-year gap. God, it is not as though it takes God 13 years to get you to the to the um to the to the throne because for all we know it was just one day the recommendation happened and Joseph ascended the throne. So it doesn't take God 13 years to get you to the throne, but it might take God 13 years or even more to get your heart in the right place. That's what I'm trying to say. And unfortunately, for the children of Israel, after they came out of Egypt, that generation. Their heart, their heart was so hardened and stubborn that God, after 40 years, God could not still get their heart in the right position to the point that God decided, you know what? I cannot deal with these people. So what I'll do is I'll wait for them to all die. When they, all of them have died, I will use their children to fulfill what I have I promised to them. And this shows you how important the state of your heart is, that God cannot do anything in your life if he doesn't work on your heart. So in the case of the Israelites, God had to wait 40 years for them to all pass away so that his word would come to pass. Because his word could not, could not not come to pass, but God could not work his word to pass in the hearts of people that were stubborn. So he had to wait for a new generation whose hearts were open to him and God used them. So I'm telling you that the weight of a man is, in a, is, is determined by the state of your heart. Because the Bible says the Lord weighs the hearts. He weighs the heart. So when God comes to a family, God, God comes to a community, God comes to a group of friends, he, he's weighing the hearts to see who, who can handle what I'm about to bring. And the person he chooses might not be the most popular, might not even be the most likely, but then he chooses the person based on the state of their heart. Because what you weigh is determined by uh, the weight of your heart. All right? Please don't forget this. And you know, one of the ways you know people with small hearts, like I said, one, one way is that yeah, um, they can't accommodate people. Another way is where is what moves them. You know, if I bring a, um, I have a piece of envelope here, right? I have a piece of envelope here. If I bring this piece of envelope and I bring this water bottle, okay? And I put two of them be in, uh, before a fan that is blowing at top speed, this envelope will likely be blown away because it weighs so little, all right? But this water bottle will still be standing because it weighs more, much. It is the same way also that the state of people's heart, how you know wh whose heart weighs more is by what moves them. What gets them to move is what is, is an indicator of the state of their heart. So for instance, a group of friends and then one person buys a new car and then uh, this this guy in this in in this group is now beginning to say ah this person bought a new car eh, it's because he bought a new car that's why he didn't pick my call the last time so what is happening is that jealousy is now encroaching to his heart meaning that thing that you know the prosperity of his friend is moving him in a negative direction so his heart is light it's too light and with this kind of people with light heart god god measures his dealings with them okay um all right so i just want to explain what moves how you can know someone with a small heart or with a light heart and someone with a heavy heart, okay? That's with a, with a not heavy heart in a sense of sorrow now, but heavy heart in a sense of the capacity, okay? So it's one way you know is by what moves them. Okay, all right. Next point I want to make is, oh, no, no, we need to visit one scripture, one more scripture before I make my next point, just to look at the weight or the size of a man's heart. First Kings chapter 4, Verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. I, this one scripture I love, and I have prayed it severally, and I really encourage you to pray it. We read from verse 29 down to maybe 34, okay? It says, And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom and great under, and exceedingly, exceedingly great understanding. Look at the next phrase. It says, and largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. So what God did for Solomon was that God expanded Solomon's heart. And I'm telling you that anytime God wants to walk in a man's life, the first thing he does is to look for work on the man's heart. That's the first point of God's call, is to walk on the heart, walk on the heart, walk on the heart. Because God can't do anything in your life beyond the posture of your heart. 
beyond the state of your heart. So when God wanted to do amazing things through Solomon, what he did was he gave Solomon wisdom, exceeding great understanding. He says, and largeness of hearts, largeness of heart. So the reason why Solomon could do all the things he did, have all the wealth he had, had all the influence he had, was because Solomon had a large heart. Look at what verse 30 says. It says, thus, or as a result of this, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. Think about this. Solomon was wiser than all men. The reason was because God gave him largeness of heart. Then he lists some men and all of that. Verse 32 says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees. From the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the high sub that springs out on the wall, meaning from a domestic tree to a forest tree, he spoke about them. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. Solomon did not live in, this, live in the water. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a riverine human being. It wasn't an aquatic animal, but yet he could speak of the fish. Verse 34 says, And all men and men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. The reason was because God gave him largeness of heart. He could entertain possibilities because his heart was wide. He could write proverbs and songs and speak about insects, speak about the ants. When you read the book of Proverbs, you see he could speak about the ants, speak about the, the lion, speak about the eagle, speak about the trees in the, in the forest and the, and the plants in the garden because he had a largeness of heart. And let me tell you something, a prayer you should pray. Please pray and ask God to give you largeness of hearts. I'm telling you. I've prayed this prayer for so long and I'm, I'm beginning to see the impact of it on my heart. That God give me largeness of heart, largeness of heart. Let me accommodate your possibilities. Let me not be easily moved by, by petty things around. Let me not be easily moved by things that move other people. Give me largeness of heart. All right? Because if God is going to entrust people into your, in, into your hands, entrust the lives of people into your hands, then he will first have to give you a large heart, a very large heart. All right? Okay, so I think I might just take one more. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Uh, okay, maybe two, two more points. Um, then we will close for today. We, we haven't finished, uh, but yeah, we'll continue next week. Okay, uh, but I, I just want to emphasize this point again, that the true weight of a man or a woman is determined by, the, by their hearts, all right? The true weight of a man, when you know that a man is a solid man, the way you know that is the state of their heart, that their heart can accommodate people. Their heart can nurture people into, into maturity, that these people's hearts are so wide enough that other people with very vast and different experiences can come into their hearts and they can find solace in their hearts, meaning they can nurture these people and guide them into maturity. When you see somebody who talks down on another person who belittles another person. That, that person has a small heart. When you see somebody who is easily, intim easily intimidated by the advancement or by the progress of another person, again, that person has a small heart. When you see someone who doesn't know how to give compliments, all right, but, but always wants the attention to be on him, you know, the person doesn't know how to give credit to others. Every time he wants, he wants other people, to, every other person to look at him. That person has a small heart. And I'm telling you that God the, God, the way God measures us in eternity is from the state of our hearts, not anything else that we have. All right. And that's why I really want you to pray that God gives you largeness of heart, largeness of heart. And that's why you see when God is increasing people, let, let me, let me use them. Um, let me use ministry as an example. When God is increasing people, increasing ministries, incre increasing the influence of people, what he looks at is the state of their heart, not even anointing or skill. And I can show you, the ministers that you know that are you know, popular and they are doing kingdom work now and they are popular, they are not necessarily the most anointed. I assure you they are not necessarily the most anointed. But rather, they are people who, who have allowed themselves who have allowed God rather to work on their hearts 
And so God can now trust them with certain levels of influence. And like I said, when I was referencing Joseph, every time God wants to bring us to a place of influence and capacity, he would first work on our hearts so that when he brings us to that position, we are not corrupted by the influence that that position affords us. Okay? So God is way, way, way more particular about our heart than most of us have recognized. Okay, let's go to the next point. Um, Hmm. Okay, I already said this, so I'll just mention it. I won't dwell on this, on this, that God doesn't choose people based on their skill. Rather, he chooses people based on their hearts. So God doesn't choose people based on their skill. What they can do or what they can't do is not, there's no way in scripture where you see that God chose a, a person to rule or God chose a person for a particular assignment because they were very skillful. No, 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 no. Not to say skill is not important, but I'll, I'll tell you where it comes in. But when God chooses people, he first and foremost chooses them because of their hearts, the state of their hearts. Then once their heart, once their heart is right before God and God has chosen them, then God can now begin to teach them and then improve, help them improve on their skill. Because David says that God chose David um, a man, um, no, no, rather, the Bible says David led the people by the integrity of his heart and by the skill of his skillfulness of his hand. But the first thing is the integrity of his heart. Then once that was settled, then the skillfulness of his hand came in. Okay. All right. So the next point I want to make is this, that, and, and this is something I personally, I learned, I'm going to close on this note. I learned from my spiritual father and I heard him say this and he really stuck to stuck with me. And I never forgot that you do not know a man by his past. Rather, you know a man by his heart. So you don't judge people by their past. You don't measure people by their past. You measure people by their heart. And this calls for a lot of spiritual maturity and wisdom. That when people come to you and they have, you know, very terrible past and all of that, or maybe you've even heard terrible things about these people in the past. Um... When you meet them, you must sustain the maturity to filter their past from their hearts. And you assess them based on their hearts, not their past. That somebody may have done terrible things in the past. No problem. Somebody may have even, you know, slandered or back, back beating you or spoken ill about you in the past. No problem. But when you have the opportunity to interface with them, you measure them by their hearts, not by their past. And like I said, this is where you begin to see spiritual maturity come in. Because when you look through scriptures, you see some very interesting uh, stories of people. And you wonder how did God end up using this kind of a person? Say Rahab, for instance, she was a popular, you know, I was going to say, she was like, they'll say it in Nigeria, she used to do hookup. She was a prostitute. And everybody knew her to be a prostitute. It wasn't a low-key low-key profession. She wasn't, I, I, I want to assume that she wasn't hiding it, okay? Because people knew her to be a prostitute. Yet, when you go to the genealogy of Jesus, for some reason, you find that name Rahab in that genealogy. And you ask yourself, how, what happened? How come a prostitute could somehow, somehow, somehow be featured in the genealogy of Jesus Christ when a whole Elijah that caught fire from heaven was not featured in that genealogy? All right, you read of prophets and other people, they're not featured, but a woman who was known to be a harlot. The reason is because, because God doesn't measure people based on their past. He measures people based on their heart. And if you are going to be like God, that should be your approach. So when you come, when come, people come to you and they tell you, oh, Victor, this is what I've done in the past. Oh, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. You need to be able to, to be, you need to be mature enough to filter what they did in their past and look at their heart and assess them. If, do they have a sincere heart? Are their hearts open to God? Then deal with them based on the state of their hearts, not based on their past. Because especially if you've been a Christian for a long time, hmm, it is very easy for you to be judgmental. When someone comes to you and says, I've been smoking, no, that only stopped smoking last month. You can look at the person and start saying, ah, and still be judging the person based on their history. That ah, this person, I used to smoke, I used to take alcohol, I used to drink. Ah, this person, hmm, I used to be careful, low. 
But that person may be the person God is sending to your life so that you can train them and nurture them into the fulfillment of destiny. But if you don't know this, you can judge them on the, based on their past and just, and just you know, miss an opportunity to be impactful in somebody's life. Another example, a fearful one I, may, I might add, is the case of Apostle Paul. Now we all call him Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, but before Acts chapter... Before Acts chapter 9, where he encountered Jesus, the name Saul was a terror. You know, now we talk about Boko Haram. At least they, they hide and they, you know, they hide and just show up and they do their disaster. In those days, Apostle Paul might have been a, a chief persecutor of the, of the church. You know, he not might have been, he was a chief persecutor of the church. He talked to the fact that he went to obtain letters to capture and put in prison anybody that identifies to be a Christian. And why this is, why he was so terrible, why I believe, I consider him to have been so terrible is that, you know, according to most military, um, military, um, um, not prior starter, but most military arms, right? Whether the army, the navy and, and the likes, there's a one particular rule that you never hit a woman. If a military, a, a proper military man, now a soldier, you meet a soldier on the road and you see a woman insulting the soldier, the soldier won't do anything. If a man tries that, the soldier will give the guy a dirty slap. But a woman, he will not touch the woman because part of their code of honor is to never raise your hand against a woman. However, Apostles Paul, when he was sold, he was arresting both women and women and children, anybody that identified that to be a believer, he was arresting them. So he was brutal. But this is the same person that after they encountered Jesus, after he encountered Jesus, rather, he began to preach the gospel and eventually became the known apostle Paul we, we, we know today. My point is that you cannot judge people by their past. You judge people by their heart. You measure people by their heart and not by their past. So as we grow in our spiritual um, walk and our, our work with God essentially, we should come to a point where we discern people. You know, Apostle Paul was one who said, uh, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. So we don't know anybody after the flesh. We don't know them after the flesh. We don't know them after their past. We discern them by their hearts. All right? And if you are going to marry, this is something you must pray and let God reveal to you. Let God reveal the heart of this person. Ask anybody that is married, all right? Whether their marriage is working or not, okay, ask them. They'll tell you that the state of the person's heart is more is the most important thing to them in that situation, all right? Um, praise the Lord. Okay, so we're going to end here, and we will continue next week. But I just want to quickly go through the things I mentioned, uh, uh, the points I mentioned earlier. Number one is that what God looks at, when, when God looks at a man, rather, the first thing he looks at is the state of the man's heart, Okay. Number two, he said that the posture of your heart can either invite God or shut God out, all right? Number three, we said that the true weight of a man is determined by the weight of his heart. And I really like this point, but I, I wouldn't emphasize it again. The true weight or size of a person is determined by their heart, okay? And we also said that God doesn't choose people based on their skill. God chooses people based on their hearts. And finally, we said you don't know a man by his, by his past. You know a man by his heart. All right? So this is an interesting conversation. I do want us to go back and really reflect on your heart and ask yourself the hard questions, right? And don't just tell yourself, oh, no, I'm a good person. Oh, I have a good heart. I have a large heart. Mm -mm. Don't just tell that. Use examples, all right? Um, think about scenarios in your life and let those scenarios be pointers to to the current state of your heart. And if you do come to a realization, don't shy away. Go to go back to God and ask God to help you. All right? So I want us to close this evening with a prayer. And I want us to just pray this for in one minute. And I want us to pray that God will give us largeness of hearts. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 4, that verse 29, that God gave Solomon largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. I want us to make that a prayer point that God will give us largeness of heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Wherever you are right now, just go ahead and pray this in just one minute. 
I pray and say, Lord, give me largeness of heart. Give me largeness of heart. Give me largeness of heart. A heart that can accommodate your possibilities. A heart that can accommodate people. A heart that can tolerate people. Yet people will come with their excesses. People will come with their habits, with their mistakes, with their past, with their flaws. Lord, give me a large heart that can accommodate these people and nurture them into greatness in the name of Jesus Christ. Give me a large heart, oh Lord. A heart that is not it easily giving to jealousy, easily giving to anger, easily giving to competitiveness, easily giving to offense. Give me a large heart, oh God. Give me a large heart in the name of Jesus Christ. That as you prosecute your work on the earth, you would find my heart worthy enough to operate through. That my life would be a useful vessel in your hand because you have given me a large heart in the name of of Jesus Christ. Oreka mosi vadaska se manoka. Rebadoska se mato valaneska. Ribadosa teka bamalasku wande si bakate. Lord, give me largeness of heart. Largeness of heart. Let me not be giving to myopic uh, expressions of my life. That I will not be reasoning in small measures and small quantities. Lord, I ask that you give me largeness of heart. That I will not be easily angered. I will not be easily offended. I will not be easily triggered. Because my heart is large, is large, is large in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, everlasting Father. We give you praise and we give you glory. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. We receive it with thanksgiving and we declare that your word finds expression in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We have prayed. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Before we go, does anyone want to share very quickly one thing that they, they learned from today's Bible study, something they picked uh, from Bible study and they're going back with? Does anyone want to share that um, quickly in just one minute before we close? Anyone wants to share one thing they learned today? Please go ahead. Praise the Lord. Oh, I I was really blessed by today's um, Bible study, and um, I want to thank you so much sir, for um, giving it to the Lord and for giving it out all out. My take home um, from the study is that um, the state of our heart is more important than whatever charisma, grace, or anointing we have, mm. that um, how far God will use us or how far will be useful in the hands of the Lord is not a function of the anointing we have. Mm. It's not a function of the grace we have. It's not even a function of the money we have, but it's a function of the nature, the condition, the likeness of our heart. Mm -hmm. And then you also made a statement that was really striking that resonated very well with me that people don't give because they have mm. they give because they have a heart of giving yes so the, the heart matter is a very very um pertinent issue that we need to really cry out to god for and that led me to go and search for this particular hymn enlarge my heart oh lord and i think i need to go and um understand and study the layers of that hymn and then also pray the hymn every single line. Mm. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you so much for sharing this. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Sister Esther, were you trying to say something we couldn't hear you? I, I know I heard some, a bit of sound from your end, but I wasn't sure if you were trying to speak or not. If you're not trying to speak, that's fine, but I just want to be sure we are not cutting you off. Okay, okay, great. All right, fantastic. All right, so thank you everyone uh, for joining in. We'll see, um, we'll continue this conversation next week. I do think it's a, it's a solemn one, to be honest. Um, um, yeah, I don't want to just dwell on it again for the cause of time, but but please go back, reflect on this and really open, expose your heart to, to, to Christ. You know, the Bible says that it is light that makes manifest. And what happens is that when we expose our hearts to light, right, that's the light of God's presence, his light will reveal what needs to be corrected in our hearts. And it may be uncomfortable at first, but that's the only way to remain accurate before God. All right, so continue next week. Um, but before then, we have our...
Friday morning prayers at 5 a.m. Nigerian time. Please do well to join in Fridays and Mondays, actually. Um, do well to join in. And I'm making a commitment that this video will be uploaded on YouTube. So please be on the lookout for it. We'll share the link uh, to, to us in our community so that we can rewatch and learn again. God bless you all. Uh, have a wonderful time. See you later.